the glory to Thee. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. All holy trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus in sequela. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is king welcome to another edition of preparation for the holy sacrifice this is our weekly guild stream for our guild members this is where we give thanks for the providence of god which has governed this whole week in other words we talk about the news or whatever else you all want to talk about so we're giving thanks for the providential governance of the world and all the affairs of geopolitics and whatnot uh, we're coming up to a big, huge U.S. presidential election going on, and we're going to be talking about that. And so we take the providence that God has provided for us this week, and we give it to the Lord as we prepare for the holy sacrifice. It's the perfect place to place all these things is at the altar. So the first part of our show, we talk about the gospel readings from three different rites of the church the ancient Roman rite, the Latin mass, the Byzantine rite, as well as the new mass. So we're talking about the day. We also have Nicholas Cavazos is with us. He's in the green room, uh, putting on his his uh, best Trump face. Trump impression uh, is, is coming soon from uh, Nicholas Cavazos, but he's with us. He'll be talking about uh, something about Trump in, in just a minute. But before I talk about that, I want to appeal to all of you to support Leo and his family. Leo is a member of our guild and our guild is here at, to function as a guild internationally on the internet, which is to say that it is an economic and fraternal confraternity of prayer and reparation where we can support one another. And part of that is helping our brother Leo and his family and this is so Leo and his family lost their home uh, last year. They did not have insurance. They were able to get by through a bunch of donations and they were able to buy a trailer in a trailer park. But now uh, the main employment was just lost after 12 years. So they're facing homelessness, actually. And we don't they don't have anywhere to go. And they're just trying to raise this emergency money. So far, they've got 8,500 of $20,000 uh, raised. So they really need your support. Please chip in something for our brother, Leo, and his family, a guild member. Uh, so please help him out. Go to the link below. Um, and we've got Nicholas Cavazos in the house. Cavazos, how you doing, brother? Good. Good to be back on MOC. It's kind of a uh, rare occurrence yeah. for me. Cool. Yeah, uh, Cavazos is going to share some... Uh, some uh trump promotion which is which is which is going to be great because we're talking about um 
voting third party acceptance swing states question mark this is ed phaser's uh comment this was from claudio our guild member who mentioned um this perspective and i hadn't i didn't seen this yet but uh let's see so here's here's the guild topics that we're going to be covering today swearing and and its euphemisms attending an invalid wedding voting third party except in swing states so we're since Kavasa is with us we'll we'll do that topic first after we talk about the gospel readings and then um number four is the tradition of attending protestant music concerts this will be interesting. And then also number five, the latest encyclical from, from Pope Francis, Delexit Nos. So we'll talk a little bit about all that stuff with all y'all's guild questions. But first, let's talk about the Gospels. So what's going on with the Gospel? So tomorrow in the ancient Roman Rite is actually not an ancient feast. It's the modern feast of Christ the King. And this, of course, was instituted by Pius XI. In his encyclical Quas Primas, uh, it is fits in with the Hallowtide Triduum, Halloween to all souls. It also corresponds against Reformation Sunday, which is what some Protestants celebrate. Um, and but the new rite went from this particular feast day and switched it to the end of the year which is commemorated a more eschatological kingship of Christ, whereas the first feast is commemorated more of a social kingship of Christ because of what Pius XI said, that the reason for World War I was that nations had cast Christ out of their laws. Now, I don't think that there needs to be a strong opposition between the social kingship of Christ and the eschatological kingship of Christ. There need to be there, these are two truths, basically, that need to both be held in tension because we can't put too much hope in this world. And we can't also just sort of ignore the social, ship, social kingship of Christ and relegate him to the end times only either. Uh, this is where I wanted to um, recommend these two texts by Scott Hahn, which I think are really, really in dealing with the very thing. Let's see. How can I unblur them? Oh, they're not. I don't know. Oh, I got it. I got it. Okay. So right and just, it is right and just. And then Catholics in exile by Scott Hahn and Brandon McGinley. So the first one is all about sort of the first feast of Christ the King tomorrow. And the second one is Catholics in exile, sort of about the final um, feast of Christ the King, uh, because exile, we're still in exile. And if we have a perfect Catholic society, Catholic polity, Catholic king, and everything's perfect, sort of speak, in this world, we're still in exile. And that's important. Uh, so after World War II, um, the the thought, the best intentions of some of these guys, like um, Paul VI, in, in relegating the feast to this eschatological vision, was a concern about totalitarianism after the war. And there's a concern about too close of a relationship between church and state, which obviously that can go too far, but it can also be an actual concern. So um, just a few comments on this feast and we'll move on to the Byzantine. So Kavas says, I, I'll, I'll just run through these gospel readings real quick. And then I, I, if you'd like to comment at all, any of this, feel free to do so. Um, Samantha, our guild member, was wondering about what are some family ideas to celebrate this feast besides going to mass? Great question. Celebrating that Jesus is king is absolutely necessary. Um, family singings, family processions. I, I consulted the uh, Von Trapp family around the year, and she did not have anything for this feast because it's Christ the King is kind of a newer feast. But I did have um, uh, Mrs. Kendra Tierney in this text. Oh, yeah, all my everything's blurry. I should have, I shouldn't have, I should unblur myself so I can show these books. Um, I usually do that if I'm a, I'm in a, a bedroom like I am, but okay, here. So here, here's Catholic all year round. So this is, this is a great text with a lot of great ideas. And she says this on page 309. So she's referring to the final feast of the year, but there's no, there's no contradiction really. He, she says, I like to serve chicken a la King for dinner. It's basically the inside of a chicken pot pie served over rice, pasta, or biscuits. Or if you're feeling really crazy, waffles. We'll have we'll have to have dessert, but that's a tougher one to figure out. I do wonder if Pius XI 
took into account the fact that there is a king cake season and the end of November isn't it. But she's confusing that obviously Pius XI put it in October. I don't know when the king cake season is, but he, she says, I suppose you could choose to live dangerously and make one for this feast, but I don't think I'll chance it. So far, we've just stuck with bunt cake crown. So always got to get a lot of uh, delicious things on these feast days. To me, that's food is like such a necessary part. Uh, and then you have um, the manual for indulgences here. This is the only place that you can get all the current indulgences that are in existence right now is this text right here. So you have to buy it from the USCCB. Um, but it does give you everything you need to obtain all the indulgences. And there is an indulgence for the Feast of Christ the King, uh, which says this. A plenary indulgence is granted to the faithful who on the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe, publicly recite the act of dedication of the human race to Christ the King, which is a prayer called Jesu Dulcissime Redemptor, which I'll link below. Um, and so I, I'm assuming that this is still in force for the old feast as well as the new. But then lastly, I want to emphasize the enthronement of the Sacred Heart. This is a great devotion for the family. Uh, we've done it our, our family. It was instituted by Pius X, I believe, but it's a really great thing to do, enthroning the Sacred Heart in your home. So with that, let's talk about the Byzantine uh, gospel, which is the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. It's Luke chapter 8, 26 and 39, which is the when our Lord, having calmed the storm in the boat, makes it to the Decapolis and he casts out the demon from the demoniac. And it's and then the, the demons beg to be put in the swine. So they go in the swine and then they run along into the water. It's a really weird tale. So I think it's one of the weirdest tales in the gospel. Um and I was really, I was looking at the Catena Aurea about this to see some kind of wisdom of this um, gospel. And um, I got this, this text from Athanasius. St. Athanasius says this, quote, If they have no power over swine, so the devil, he's saying that the devils have to ask permission to go into pigs. So Athanasius says, if they have no power over swine, the evil spirits have much less against men who are made after the image of God. We ought then to fear God alone, but despise them. Uh, so the context is that after calming the storm, the legion of demons, which represents a legion is 6,000 Roman troops, is subject to Christ, and they cannot even inhabit swine without permission from God, but with his permission, they can destroy as they destroy the swine. And so it's it's a one, it's a manifestation of Christ's divine power over the demons. He's he's the wind and storm obey him, and also the legion of demons obey him. But unless we're on the side of the Lord, we can become like the swine. And with his permission, we can fall into demonic oppression and be destroyed just like that. Okay. Finally, in the new rite of mass, the 30th Sunday. Tempest per annum uh, has a theme of blindness. And the thing that struck me about this was blind Bartimaeus, uh, the son of Timaeus. The text in Mark 10 actually emphasizes Timaeus because bar Timaeus means son of Timaeus. So the text itself says son of Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. And Timaeus is a Greek word. I, I got these things from John Bergsman, Scott Hahn, and they're weekly podcast on the on the new right um and it's very interesting because it, it it seems to indicate that the blind man is quite hellenized so he's quite assimilated into a gentile culture and he's blind and yet his spiritual vision is totally 2020 because he says jesus son of david have pity on me and so he sees better than the pharisees who do not see, and there's a similar type of uh, juxtaposition between physical blindness and spiritual blindness in St. John's Gospel, the healing, of, the healing of the man born blind, where our Lord says, because you claim that you see, you are blind. Um, I found that very powerful. It made me think of a recent um, study that I was, I was looking at, um, which made a big impact on my thinking, and that is uh, the psychology of the cross. And this is from a, a Catholic psychologist by the name of Dr. Kevin Maheres. 
uh, and he was on Catholic Gentleman. So Catholic Gentleman had him on and they were talking about depression. And basically, or he, he deals with uh, anxiety disorders and depression. And he says that basically depression is a, a habit of your mind where you hyper focus on the negative aspects of a thing, which clouds out all the positive aspects. That seems sort of simple, but when you're actually in depression or you're in desolation, that's really difficult to look at. But if you look at it properly with sort of this psychology of the cross, which is basically the rules of St. Ignatius of Leola, where you're looking at the desolation, you're looking at these different things, and you're looking at them through the eyes of faith, through the psychology of the cross, and you're looking at this desolation, and you see a positive in the negative, because it gives you the, uh, the detachment from earthly things, from earthly consolations, in order to embrace the suffering and truly grow in virtue. And it's really quite remarkable how powerful this is, I think, because uh, it's something that really helps you through desolation when you're thinking properly about what this is and what its long-term goal is or positive can be. Uh, I found that to be very impactful with the uh, rules of St. Ignatius. So that's all I got to say on these three gospel readings. Gavasos, do you have any comments before we move into our political discussion? No, those were very interesting observations that you made. I agree with you very much about the tension that you do see in the kind of old Roman right of looking at the social kingship of Christ from a political standpoint, you know, a temporal earthly political standpoint, and then the eschatological reign of Christ the King. We can't have one or the other, you know, and exalt one or the other because both of them are true at the end of the day. Um, I think that we just have to kind of recalibrate ourselves and ask ourselves, um, you know, where am I taking too much of a focus on? For instance, the individuals who are always looking for the end of the world, you know, and not doing things that here and now to try to actually make the world a better place, that can be an issue. And then we can have the opposite, which is just life is for the here and now. Let's kind of just conquer and reign over everything now, build a utopia, if you will. And then we miss the point, which is that our souls are eternal. They're made in the image and likeness of God, and they have a final beatitude that they must reach. So both go together. It's nature and grace, if you will, working together in nature and then, of course, in the supernatural life. So both of them are very important. And then uh, when it comes to the Greek readings, yeah, no, those are very interesting. Of course, I'm very, very much so a novice in the world of anything Eastern. And so hearing kind of their uh, liturgical calendar readings is very interesting. Cool. Well, thanks, Kvaso. So with that, uh, we're going to end the public portion of this video. Next up, we're going to be talking about, we're going to skip to number three, talk about the voting third party except in swing states, Ed Fazer's view on this. And we'll have, Kvasos will kind of provide a counterpoint, I think, to him. And then we'll be talking about swearing to euphemisms, Italian invalid weddings, some various moral questions, as well as the latest encyclical from Pope Francis. So if you want the whole show, you have to go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to become a guild member and uh, be a part of our guild community. And you can access this show every week. Okay, we'll be right back. Mm -hmm.